it's Tuesday afternoon, 4 p.m. Central European Summertime, and I am Elena Bocale, Event Coordinator Spacewatch Global. And it is my pleasure to welcome you here again today for the comeback of Space Cafe Benelux with our new host, Dr. Heike Poignan. As always, we truly value your participation and ongoing feedback. We're committed to learning from your input and continuously improving our webinars to make them more engaging and informative for you. Spacewatch Global is a Europe-based online platform for information in and about space and new space activities in a geopolitical context. I would like to thank all our private and corporate supporters in 2023 that showed their commitment to keep our independent journalism alive. Thank you. We really appreciate that. I know many of you are familiar with our um, website, our platform, our bi-weekly and daily newsletters, and the Space Cafe podcast. Don't miss uh, the latest episode of uh, the podcast NASA, with NASA's Kim Arkand, Unraveling the Universe uh, Data story, that Storyteller with Marcus Muslechner. We also have new episodes of our Space Cafe radios, featuring from uh, Glock in Oslo, Dr. Nicole Quijano Evans from the UN's Office on Drugs and Crime, and also from Glock with NASA's Susie Perez Quinn, Dr. Karen San Germain, and Dr. Kate Calvin. We talked about the new NASA Earth Information Center and that it is just that it has just opened last Friday. You hear, you hear first with us. And our second episode of the Space Cap Economy Insight podcast is also was also released recently with Matt Gilliham by Kevin O'Connell and Hemma, our editor in chief, is online as well. There is truly a lot to listen to at the moment. You can find <laughs> yeah, and that was a moment where we lost a Eleanor. Elena? So, yeah, what she was about to say is that you can find us on all of the pe uh, podcast platforms that are available. But without further ado, take it over to you. Okay, thank you, Torsten, also Elena, for having us today and, and for the kind introduction to my very first Space Cafe Benelux. I'm actually quite excited. So also welcome again to our audience and especially to our, my guest today, Dr. Harald Hauschild, with whom I'll discuss the question, will optical and quantum communication be the future of space? So Harald, maybe let's introduce you first. You are a physicist and astrophysicist. Um, you work with renowned institutions like Caltech and the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy. Um, in a former life, you also worked at DLR, the German Aerospace Center, in the role of the German delegate to ESA. And you were responsible for the German participation in the USA German Laser Crosslink Program between the US Enfire and the German Terrasar X satellite, the starting point for the EDRS program. And now you are at the European Space Agency managing the ESA Arta Skylab program, which is dedicated to space-based optical communication and quantum communication, actually our topic of today. Um, part of your job is also the preparation and implementation of major projects like Hydron on Saga. We might hear about those a bit later if time permits. So before we ri dive right into to it, Maybe just briefly coming back to the beginning of your career, um, what made you pursue a space career? Was there an initial spark and are you still as fascinated as you, you were then? Okay, uh, thank you, Heike, and thank you for the uh, invited all and also for this unexpected question. But <laughs> indeed, side, since uh, I think many around that are working in space, uh, I have been inspired by uh, things like uh, the moon uh, flight uh, 96, but also uh, then uh, the Star Trek series that shows you beyond uh, the universe. And this somehow inspired me while nobody in my whole family had anything to do with physics or astronomy at all. And this uh, enthusiasm uh, uh, were captured as an amateur astronomer building my own telescope uh, and later on joining then uh, the uh, institutions like Caltech, 
uh, where you do basic uh, research, astronomy, uh, the Max Planck Institute, as you mentioned as well, uh, and later on the uh, German Aerospace Center uh, dealing with uh, with the space programs with ESA. And finally, uh, in in ESA itself, I'm uh, located in Estec in Nordwijk in Holland, where ESA has its technical center. Okay, thank you. So it's great to still have the, the fascination of that. I, I can can relate to that. So coming to the maybe some futuristic topic for, for some of our our uh, um, public watching, the, the optical and quantum communication. So if this will be the future of space, that's our question today. So currently you're heading the Artist Skylight program, which is spelled with C, not with K, because it stands for secure and laser communication technology. So always beware of the automatic correction. Um, so can you explain a bit the program a bit um, to our audience? Since when does Skylight exist? Uh, why was it born? Yeah, because the, because the audience might be a bit broader and not only uh, people uh, working in the field. Um, first, to answer the question, uh, it will be the future of space. Um, yeah. It will be the future in space uh, applications. That's, uh, that's I'm sure. And I'm working since 20 years in the field already. But what is optical communication? I think it's uh, pretty easy and we all have that at home uh, already. We, we used to have fiber uh, links in our home uh, using uh, photonics uh, elements in order to provide us the data uh, that we need at home for internet applications like the webinar uh, today. And uh, like in uh, on the Earth, the uh, the data rate, uh, um, the demand for data rate in space is also increasing and increasing, but we cannot deploy uh, fiber cables between the satellites or the satellites to ground. So what we do, and that is the main uh, part of the optical communication. We deploy lasers on board the different uh, systems and then uh, uh, send the data via the laser link between the different space assets, so from satellite to satellite or from satellite to ground, um, and uh, transport then the data with an extremely high bandwidth down to ground. Um, this, uh, Demand for uh, data rate is will increase further, like uh, on Earth. The current prediction is that this will, by end of the decade, increase by a factor of 500. And uh, that is the reason why we will need optical communication to uh, have this kind of communication between the different, uh, different orbits. Coming to your question, uh, back in 2016, when the program actually started, um, we had already demonstrated that laser links in principle in orbit uh, work. We, I did uh, part of the work uh, at my former career at DLR, as you mentioned, for the uh, US-German cross-link uh, program between the NFIRE satellite and the Terrasa satellite, where we demonstrated 5.6 gigabit per second between two LEO satellites. And you have to imagine that these two LEO satellites are flying with 28,000 kilometers an hour each. And you still have to find in the on the other side the laser, the telescope that is receiving the laser uh, light uh, with a diameter of about 10 centimeters uh, over a distance of 8,000 kilometers. That was already very demanding, but we demonstrated this is working. And based on that, we extended then um, together uh, in the ESA program this application to the European data really satellite system EDIS, which is still functional, and we come back to that perhaps later. However, we saw the potential of optical comms, high data rate um, uh, between uh, different space orbits transmitting in uh, the space as well, uh, having the chance to uh, transfer the data between the terrestrial and a non-terrestrial network as well. But we had only a few companies uh, in Europe that are ready to take the, uh, the challenge, uh, that have mastered that, that had looked into that. But the potential that we saw um, uh, inspired the uh, ESA member states to create a new program dedicated for optical and quantum communication that is called Skylight. The program, just for the ones not knowing it, uh, is using two elements. One is a, is a work plan where ESA is proposing different activities uh, to the industrial leaders. Um, showing 
what needs to be developed, where are still the challenges, uh, what do we need uh, still uh, for the future applications. And on the other hand, uh, this program is open for the ideas of the different uh, industrialists, uh, for the companies that see a future market in the developments uh, of, of products uh, and applications, and they can come to us propose their ideas uh, together with the national delegations and get support for their ideas and, and keep also the, the IPRs, the intellectual property rights, to further extend then their ideas in a product. Yeah, I think that's, that's very interesting to know how uh, industry can participate and how to approach you. Um, so there are then other quantum applications, quantum computing are part of other dedicated programs in other directorates, is that correct? We, we do have activities also for quantum computing. Uh, there's a program uh, in our Earth Observation program that is dealing with that because they have to acquire a lot of data in the Earth Observation programs and they are dealing with application in that uh, area. Mm -hmm. But the communication part is a part of the directorate I'm working in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the skylight, I meant, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so. Harold, you you and I, we know, you said it was 2016, I think, and uh, we both know each other since that actually initiation of the Skylight program through the Quartz project, which has been a while now I think about it, and there are annual workshops. And um, at the last one, we clearly saw that we are emerging from this initial nerd group talking to each other about things we already know, more or less in sort of a bubble to finally reaching other less space tech people like like more business or legal, non-experts, not familiar with the quantum part, et cetera. But they just use the opportunities or see the opportunities will lie in the application. So I think that's very positive. And I would like to ask you if you agree with that um, observation and if, you would say Skylight has been quite successful and the right thing to do. Maybe I'm not the right one to ask, but uh, yes, we see a high interest uh, more and more uh, in the industrial uh, world. The workshop, the annual workshop uh, or the conference that you mentioned uh, is indeed one of the most uh, important conferences in Europe. Uh, now that is already a success. And the idea is to bring the different stakeholders together. As you said, initially in the first uh, uh, conferences, we had the nerds, if you want to see it like that, uh, the ones already working in the fields, uh, be it in the labs, be it uh, in the industry, um, and uh, but, but not the people that have applications in mind. Now in the conference that we had in, uh, in essence, um, we had many players, first of all, many newcomers, new companies that use the program uh, to bring in their new ideas. Um, uh, and uh, on the same time, we had people talking about the applications where they see optical uh, and uh, quantum communication uh, at stage in the real uh, in the real life. So this has, has changed. Uh, and uh, I think also the maturity of the technology has changed. As I said, with many players around, we have different solutions uh, on the terrestrial side, on the space side, uh, and we have quite an enormous wide range of companies in Europe and, and Canada that is now dealing with the subject. Okay, so it seems like it was been the, the right program, the right place now, finally, maybe almost overdue. <laughs> that's a that's a feed, uh, feedback we got actually for at the workshop okay. uh, where the people appreciated the, the chance to have the interaction between each other, which is mm -hmm. the main reason for the for the workshop. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Yes, in in the program actually you are concentrating op optical satellite communication um, and mentioned already some reasons in 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 your introduction of the the program, but can you tell us a bit more like What's wrong with RF? I mean, if I look at the weather earlier today, uh, we couldn't have had a decent conversation if our connection was optical. Um, so, so what's the difference? Currently would be fine, I think, but. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so what's the difference to classical RF versus optical comms? Uh, so the lasers, as you said, it's of course the bandwidth you mentioned, signal quality. Uh, what are the typical applications? and Maybe what about frequency coordination? 
Yes, uh, a wide range that you you to cover yeah. indeed uh, for yeah. RF, and there's nothing wrong. So, uh, <laughs> optical and RF communication are two uh, sides of the same coin, if I may say so. Uh, both are dealing with data uh, transport uh, for our daily lives, and and both will remain, um, but they will uh, complement each other. As you said, uh, there are strengths and uh, weaknesses for both uh, technologies depending on, on the application and different ways of working around on that. In RF, however, we have more than 100 years uh, of experience already. We know exactly how to tweak uh, the receivers, how to tweak um, the, the transmitters uh, and the systems uh, and the am amplifications, uh, the protocols that we use uh, to overcome uh, some of the side effects from the atmosphere. So we have a lot of experience there already, but on optical, we didn't have that. That was the reason, as I said, for the Skylight program. Uh, here, we needed uh, the extra mile to go uh, and to help uh, industry to, uh, to increase uh, their knowledge on that. As you said, the main uh, argument for optical comms is the bandwidth. And uh, for the ones uh, perhaps not being the physicist, the bandwidth or the amount of data that you can transmit is directly proportional to the frequency. And here between RF and optical, we have already a factor of 1,000 uh, in, in the frequency difference, so a factor of 1,000 of bandwidth and, and data rates that we can uh, achieve uh, theoretically in the, in the transmission. Um, regulation, maybe before I come to that, uh, there I would like to stick to the limiting factors, not only pray for optical comms, as you said, the weather is one of the limiting factors. In uh, today's, also here in Holland, where I am, uh, the weather is quite good, so we could have uh, optical comms through the atmosphere, um, but uh, this is not always the case. So what we need is a, uh, are technologies that uh, overcome this kind of uh, difficulties. And one answer to that is adaptive optics. Uh, with that, I can uh, have a system that is illuminating, basically uh, reducing, eliminating the uh, twinkling of the stars that we see in the night, the, the, the atmospheric scintillations that is um, reducing my signal quality um, while going through the atmosphere. So that is one element to use also not so nice weather conditions. But if I have clouds, there's no other way around than having another ground station somewhere to have a network of ground station um, to use and uh, bring the data down. But here, the second element we need is a network in space, which so far doesn't exist uh, in, in the optical field. And, and we at ESA are working on a high throughput optical network uh, called Hydron. You mentioned it uh, before. Um, and the idea here is that you have the routing capabilities that you have also on the terrestrial side. Today, when you send your information via internet, you don't care which is the, the routing uh, does it go via Brussels? Does it go via uh, Amsterdam or Frankfurt? You simply don't know and you don't care. You know in the end the data will be there where it's needed. And that is a bit the, the idea that we also fulfill with uh, Hydron, having a network capabilities there, which means we need not only the lasers going through the atmosphere, going between the satellites, but we need also the routing on board the satellites. Uh, we need the data handling on board the satellites in order to cope with the very high data rates. And we need the same technology on ground to integrate this uh, into terrestrial networks, because here's the second part of the network. We have the uh, space network and the non-space network. And the coming to the regulation part, uh, indeed, for the ones that know, uh, the, the air spectrum is quite limited, quite regulated. Uh, and we have seen the financial value of these uh, frequencies when we think about the auctions uh, for the mobile frequencies uh, some years ago in the different countries that we have seen how much value these uh, frequency bands really have in, in the day-to-day -day life. Uh, and this is also the case for satellite uh, communication. It's very, very regulated, and it, today it's very hard to get a larger piece of bandwidth in some RF uh, bands. This is not the case in optical, because here we have, uh, first of all, no regulation, but also no interference between the different signals. The beams that we are using on top is, are extremely narrow compared to RF beams, which makes optical communication also very hard to detect and very hard to interfere with, which gives also an additional security layer on optical communication uh, technologies. Okay, thank you. That was uh, 
Uh, good insight. So one more question into that regard. What kind of power are we talking about? So I've been asked already, do I get grilled in a laser beam? Um, so is it a threat or to what, what, what is done, what is done about it? So. Well, yes, well, the current systems in orbit work uh, on a very low uh, power uh, uh, elements uh, uh, down to 0 0.2, 0 0.5 watts. Uh, between the satellites. Uh, the good thing is here, we don't have any absorption uh, that we have to cope with. Um, uh, if if the sizes of the telescopes are uh, are done in the correct uh, sizing. Going through the atmosphere, uh, going also the long distances from Earth to space, uh, to LEO, which is 800 kilometer, but going up to the GEO is 40,000 kilometers. We need um, powers that are much higher, uh, 10 watts, uh, 50 watts, uh, which for a laser is extremely uh, a lot. I, I used to have a laser in my lab, which is 50 watts uh, output power, and I was able to grill uh, a brick stone in the beam if I if I need be. So we don't want to do that. Um, we have different mechanisms. One is we are using the laser beam in a large telescope, so the overall beam is is much uh, larger. So the power per square centimeter is relative uh, low. And that is what, what counts. On top, uh, when we go uh, through the atmosphere in, in both directions, we will need to look for uh, air traffic, uh, for example, uh, that should not intercept with the beams for security reasons. I, I would not say this is a real danger, but we need to look at that. We will need to deploy aircraft detection systems um, that are looking that we are not interfering with the traffic overhead one of the ground stations. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that that's always interesting to have an order of magnitude because, uh, yeah, if this is interesting. So then there are also people. I've I've heard people say that they expect no latency with optical, which unfortunately not entirely true, because speed of light still needs some time from A to B. But is there a difference to RF or? Um, it's it's an electromagnetic wave, or only in the atmosphere, or is this negligible? So the, the uh, latency depends uh, more on the distance. As you said, the speed of light is true for both, for optical comms and for RF, so there's no difference. The difference is where it is deployed. And uh, what we see for low latency uh, internet services, for example, the operators like Starlink, like Elon Musk, they go into the LEO orbit in order to have low latency communication, which is important, for example, for voice communication. For other applications like uh, um, bandwidth demanding video transmissions, the latency is not so important because if you start your movie uh, uh, um, 10, uh, 100 milliseconds earlier or later, this doesn't make a difference. The jitter in between is more, more important for the signal quality. So the latency is coming with the application from a LEO or from a GEO. And from a GEO, indeed, we would have a latency of about 200 uh, milliseconds for the signals, which is considered for internet uh, connections already too large for some applications. Yeah. Not for our, all and maybe not for the majority, but for some of them. No. Okay, thank you. So you already mentioned the drawbacks as well. So, but yeah, that was a, a great insight for in optical communication advantages, also some uh, some challenges. So maybe to move on to the next question, a more specific application. So how does optical satellite communication support deep space missions and exploration? Is there a particular advantage in that? Yeah, before before I go to deep space, I would still like to be a bit closer to Earth and uh, just <laughs> uh, inform the audience uh, what we have already out there. Um, so we, I mentioned already Starlink. Starlink is using uh, optical communication uh, between the satellites, uh, and they do the operators for these kind of mega constellations do that to operate the satellite in a more effective way. They can transmit the, the commanding data to one satellite, and then with the network, this command is transferred to the satellite that is actually affected uh, for adapting a service uh, or for transmitting uh, information. Uh, if you go a bit higher, we use have, we already have a, a data relay system in orbit uh, called EDIS, European Data Relay uh, System. Um, this is using laser links to connect uh, today the Sentinel-1 and 2 satellites 
to a geostationary orbit, and uh, this is increasing the time uh, for the ground uh, connection uh, to about 40 minutes when the satellites, the LEO satellites, the Sentinels see the geo satellite, transfer all the data with one uh, with uh, 600 megabit per second up to the geo and then down to ground. This helps uh, to reduce uh, the overall amount of data in the memory system of these satellites. And this memory can be used then for other uh, data collected somewhere in the world. So this is happening already today. We have up to today uh, nearly 80,000 laser links already established in the system, and they are working without any, any flaw. So that is what we have uh, achieved already. Going for deep space, um, I think, what uh, we should uh, think about is that um, if we all want to go to the moon. This is currently the new the new hype, uh, and we want to stay on the moon. And uh, uh, I heard uh, next week there will be another call with my director general, who also will mention that we want to go back to the moon uh, together with our our friends in the US. And um, this is also considered to be one of the uh, new business cases. And every time you go out for uh, some uh, uh, business case and, and larger explorations, uh, then you would need a network connection. Today, this is done with RF, and we all remember the pictures uh, from the moon landing, uh, which were sometimes a bit hard to see. And I think when we want to go next time to the moon, and uh, if we have Europeans landing on the moon, I think we all want to have uh, high definition uh, TV signals. And for that, you need high data rates, and uh, optical is certainly one way to go. Today it's not in the focus of the of the moon missions. We have other technical challenges to go back to the moon, but we are working on uh, uh, having optical comms also implemented in into this program. ESA is currently working on a system that is called Moonlight, uh, which is not with me. It is a, a program uh, looking for. Um, communication and uh, navigation services around the moon, uh, three satellites to be deployed around the moon uh, in order to have um, the right communication and network capabilities and um, uh, navigational uh, services for rovers and for astronauts down on the, on the moon uh, in order to tell them every time where they are, where they have to go to guide them. So this is happening also in preparation for the commercialization of the moon. So optical comms, in my view, will play a role there because we need the network capabilities there. And if we talk about network capabilities, I think we talk about optical comms. Okay. Yeah, that's that's definitely very exciting. And I think also if we only start with the moon as sort of a first basis and then want to explore even further. So I see the, the advantages of having all that information out there in in a in a high quality and in a high throughput to to have it have the data available yeah so, if, I, if i if i may uh, amend sorry uh, okay, Heike. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we should perhaps also say that there are currently um, a mission from nasa um, that is uh, using optical comms bringing data down to gone is a psyche mission going to a comet and they want to transfer data optically down to ground. And we have a couple of telescopes around the world that will receive this data. So also here, we, and in this case, NASA is uh, using optical comms already. And uh, if you look to the data amount that the James Webb telescope, for example, is producing, also the very deep space communication can benefit from optical uh, communication. Of course, the technical challenges are also not negligible and, and the cost with it. Great, thank you. Um, so now we have a bit of an idea why optical is, is great and also the future, but um, where does the quantum part come in? So the other part of our <laughs> discussion today. So what is the difference? What is quantum communication? What's QKD? So it, it's not maybe have a deep dive into the quantum physics, but uh, how it works, but what is it good for? What What are the differences to the optical or the complementarity yeah i would say that uh, quantum communication is still a field to be explored but the idea behind is that uh, if you go down to the quantum uh, level of a photon so we are talking about single photons uh, and we are talking about the quantum uh, states of these photons 
and they, we can have multiple states for this uh, photon. So it's already going. It's hard not to go to the quantum physics here. Um, <laughs> you have you have uh, quantum states there. If you take that for a moment, uh, you can use these quantum states to transmit also data. Um, today we use a, a photon. We count the photon. Uh, if we don't count one, uh, it is uh, zero. Uh, sorry, if we count one <laughs> in the right polarization, it's a zero. We can say that it's a zero. And if we have it in another polarization, uh, it uh, it can be a one. So we have two, um, uh, 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 sorry, uh, we have a binary uh, concept of the communication, a zero of one, as we used uh, to have that in, in our internet uh, communication as well. If you use multiple states, not only polarization of a photon, you can do multiple states. So it can be something between a zero and a one, could be other uh, uh, values. And with that, you can use optical comms to transmit at the same time much more data with one photon than you can do that in the classical optical field. That is a, the the power. That will be is also the power on, for the quantum computer. Uh, and we hear a lot of uh, companies currently developing quantum computers. And I think nearly every week we see a new quantum computer um, uh, being realized in the in the different labs. Um, and uh, used for the right applications, these computers can um, produce a, a much higher, uh, a powerful uh, computational uh, elements than we have it today in the, the in the systems. So, if you want to use it for quantum communication, uh, this this can be done as well. It's a more complex than uh, classical optical communication because you are first of all dealing with very very weak signals uh, on on photon level. Um, if they are going to transmit through some medium like an atmosphere, it is really hard to lose it uh, on the way. As we said, um, uh, the optical communication are millions of uh, photons here. We are dealing with one. So we have technical challenges on that. But the, the good point is uh, if we manage that, and one of the applications is, as you said, quantum key distribution, um, then we can transmit signals and use the quantum uh, features uh, as well, because uh, the quantum uh, elements, the states uh, have uh, the nice uh, property that they are changing uh, when you are looking to them. Um, and perhaps some people know the, the Schrodinger's cat, which can be at the same time dead or alive, depending if you look in the box or not. Um, this is a bit uh, a, a strange uh, comparison of quantum uh, uh, physics in the real world. But in principle, if you transfer secrets, uh, uh, elements of a secret key, for example, with single photons, uh, you are able to detect on the other side if somebody on the way for the transmission has looked at the photon or not, because it will have different quantum states in the end. And if you communicate with the sender uh, in a uh, in some classical ways, then you can uh, say that somebody has listened in. If somebody listened in, then you would simply discard the key and send another one. That is one of the big features for the transmission of the keys itself, uh, and that is the 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 current discussion that uh, quantum key distribution can add a additional uh, value of um, security into the transmission channel. There are other elements on the security level that needs to be improved in order to have a ultra secure system, but the link in between can be physically at least uh, be relatively secure. Okay. So that is then on top of this point to point, which laser makes, which makes optical as such already secure the quantum, um, quantum part or the quantum communication would even be more secure. And it would help with the encryption capabilities, if I understand that correctly. It, it um, would help here. There. Mm -hmm. Just, uh, just to be correct, and I know there are many experts out there yeah. listening, there are, of course, other ways also to encrypt the data in a secure yeah. uh, way, also in view of the threats for a quantum computer. The post-quantum yeah. uh, um, methods uh, also provide uh, the, the security there. And what we might see in the future is a combination of multiple encryption me mechanisms, so quantum key distribution uh, and post-quantum mm -hmm. uh, in one way or the other. Yeah, we should on. we should perhaps yes. mention that the European Commission is running a, a program called Uri QCI looking exactly 
in uh, in the application of uh, quantum key distribution, quantum communication. It's called European quantum communication infrastructure that the Commission is looking into. And ESA is supporting uh, them with the space component mm -hmm. uh, for um, this system, which is called Zaga uh, for a secure and cryptographic mission that we are that we are building up. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks for for clarifying that uh, um, that there. Of course, this is only one solution to 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 secure, make it more secure. But I, I would also like to highlight to 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 un that I do understand correctly that we need to distinguish between between the communication on the one hand or optical communication and then the keys encryption that we said, like the the QKD. Um, which are which are encryption keys so it's not if i send encryption keys it's not containing the communication as such it's just keys to encrypt um communication which i can then exchange on on ed, any other channel terrestrial or wherever exactly so the what is behind qkd quantum key distribution is sending single photons out there uh, single photons, that, which are elements of a key, and I need multiple transmissions, multiple of these single photons, in order to establish uh, a key element. This key is then used for doing the encryption uh, over classical channels. I can also have uh, today other kinds of keys uh, downloaded to my system. Uh, I can encrypt my message and send it out. So the difference in QKD is the transmission of the key, where I can, in principle, detect that somebody has listened into the communication and that makes it extremely uh, important. We can mm -hmm. compare, it, compare it perhaps with the uh, with a security guy who is traveling around the world with his uh, suitcase uh, with all the keys, which is mm -hmm. uh, interlocked to his, uh, to his arm. Um, and uh, so if somebody wants to kill still these keys, he has to kill the guy. And then if the guy is dead, we know somebody has the keys. So this is a bit <laughs> what we want to avoid with quantum key distribution. This is one of the ways. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Very. <laughs> perhaps because you mentioned uh, Heike, the Quartz project where you mm -hmm. were acting on uh, back in uh, your SES times. Uh, we have not only the European Commission looking into uh, quantum key distribution, but also the commercial market looking into it. Mm -hmm. And ESA is working with uh, a couple of partnership programs um, in, in different areas of, uh, of Europe uh, to have a commercial application of quantum key distribution, looking for similar ways of security and similar applications, mm -hmm. but on the commercial market. Okay, thank you. I have, um, I think we have a question here, which which is, um, which can, I think is the right uh, moment to, to ask it. So thank you all for this first Benelux Space Cafe, which is great. Here is a question. How do you evaluate China's status in space quantum communications and how ahead of the game they might be? Should we worry? I did not uh, mention that actually for both for optical communication and also for quantum communication, we see currently major investments around the globe. Uh, in the US, we see uh, systems uh, being procured by uh, by the government, by the space development agencies for uh, mega constellations using to a large extent optical comms. So they are creating a big market, but also a threat that uh, in the end we will in Europe not have the products uh, anymore to to uh, fulfill this market perspective. Um, and we see activities on optical and quantum uh, comms in China uh, to a large extent, in Japan, in uh, in India, and all these states are pumping a lot of money into the technologies because they have seen that the technology of, of optical and quantum communication is a strategic um, uh, development and they want to avoid any dependencies. So the uh, the Chinese uh, indeed are doing an impressive work. Uh, they have started some issues satellite uh, a couple of years back and they did uh, a lot of quantum experiments. They are already from space. Um, they did it in an experimental environment uh, to telescopes uh, in the Himalaya, big telescopes uh, that are used for these kind of experiments and was extremely successful and perhaps surprised also some players in, in Europe. 
and uh, part of the activities we see in Europe were triggered due to this little surprise. On top, uh, the Chinese uh, are using that also in terrestrial systems. They have a network of more than 2,000 kilometers where different players, banks, uh, administration, and so on are uh, included uh, and doing uh, also experiments here. Um, what we know is this is currently not an operational service, it's still experimental phase. And what the European Commission is trying uh, to establish with the UQCI program is instead an operational system uh, having applications then, uh, across different fields. So we have to be worried, but worried in a, in a way that we have to be ready, that we have to, to select the right technologies to invest in. Uh, and provide the, uh, the capabilities, the investment capabilities to help our industry in Europe and Canada uh, to, to prepare for this kind of market, like in many other areas in the industry as well. All right, thank you uh, for that answer. I think that uh, was, a, was a good summary of, of all that, what's going on. I have another related question to quantum, so maybe we put it in here as well. Um, from Terry, so thank you. Michio Kaku, Michio Kaku in his new book, Quantum Supremacy posits that the information transfer, uh, that the information transfers faster than the speed of light. Are you in agreement of this possibility? I mean, no, that is, that is. Quantum teleportation or something like that. <laughs> the, the teleportation is uh, in principle on, uh, that has been proven already in, in the labs. Um, this means that you have uh, entangled photons sent out uh, and uh, in principle, you could use it for uh, a teleportation between uh, different uh, regions in space. Uh, the spooky uh, element here is that if you have entangled photons, um, they are twins basically, and if they travel through time and space, uh, they are still uh, interconnected uh, on the quantum levels. And if you change one of them, uh, as I said, by observing it, uh, for example, it, the other will also change. Uh, this, however, is not a data transfer. It's a change of quantum states, but not a data transfer. And therefore, it is not considered to be uh, uh, quicker than the speed of light. The speed of light, unfortunately, Einstein is still limiting us on that. I would also like to have systems that are uh, uh, quicker, but I'm afraid <laughs> we have to wait a bit uh, on that. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a, another question regarding the, the quantum key distribution. Are there legal aspects um, of regarding deployment of quantum key distribution or quantum communication? Are there um, governments that that say no, you can't, you can't deploy your keys in my country? Or um... uh, I think it depends if we if we consider the commercial application or a governmental uh, mm -hmm. uh, application. And for the governmental part, of course, all the security relevant uh, limitations uh, and uh, accreditations and so on are to be uh, to be recognized like in any other secure communication field sometimes and depending on the country the security levels are regulated uh, as well so yeah. i would say yes i'm not sure if i fully answered your question with that yeah I th yeah you answered i think <laughs> it's there are legal issues to be respected so it's not like it's not regulated and you can just go ahead and do it so um, coming a bit to the more practical part, um, so you already mentioned a lot of um, uh, ongoing projects, but how mature is optical and quantum communications? Um, so the, the main challenges of practical implementation, you have, of course, the technical ones where you mentioned a few, mm -hmm. but again, um, um, alignment issues from the technical part, but then also politically standardization, wealth lengths, interfaces, financing. So there are a lot of challenges, I guess, until we're there. So where are we now? Which is one of the reasons why we have the program, because we still have a lot of challenges <laughs> ahead of us. Um, but uh, we we are getting to different levels of challenges. So the inter-satellite links between the different assets um, this is a, a subject multiple companies have mastered already with the technologies. Um, 
the the big question in my view is now going to even higher data rates i would say laser terminals up to 2.5 gigabits per second data rates for leo satellites are currently considered a standard so the americans are currently procuring that as products uh, from different suppliers and uh, the americans started also with uh, implementation standard for their application because they don't want to be limited to one of the suppliers. So the standards is extremely important in order to have an open market, to have multiple suppliers that can talk to each other and maybe also interconnect different uh, systems later on, different mega constellations helping each other. Let's uh, assume Starlink and Kuiper from Amazon are cooperating in the end. Uh, if they want to do so, they would need a standard to interchange the data in the same Way. This comes then to the wavelengths, and uh, here indeed we had multiple implementations um, for different reasons. Uh, they were uh, good um, uh, and and beneficial for the time. Uh, part of them, uh, 800 nan uh, nanometer systems, were due to the availability of the lasers for for space applications. So they were used first in Silex, for example, many many years ago, even before I started uh, in the field. Um, and then we had uh, a, a wavelength of 1064 nanometers or 1064 nanometers. This is used in the EDS system, uh, which also uh, has a, a great capabilities because you can have relatively small uh, terminals, applications, uh, um, uh, telescopes on board the satellite. So the size of your equipment is relatively small. Um, Mainly due to the commercial market, um, we see now that everything is moving to 1,550 nanometers, which is the wavelength that is also used in terrestrial networks. And here the idea was also to use terrestrial equipment uh, to uh, space qualify it and use it then and, and use the, the lower market entry level with a lower cost and so on uh, in order to make that uh, that happen. So. SDA has uh, produced a standard, as I said, this is using 1,550 nanometers. And also ESA is currently preparing a standard for going beyond what uh, we have done in the US already, because our aim, as I said, uh, with the Hydron program is uh, to really have something that is similar to the capabilities on the terrestrial side, which means um, laser communication terminals that go up to terabit per second, which is uh, standard on ground, that have routing capabilities, uh, and that have uh, also processing capabilities uh, in, in space. So this kind of things we need to do, the standards on one thing in order to have multiple suppliers um, and demonstration of the high data rates between the satellite uh, satellites and also satellite to ground. And we have to master, which is one of the extra challenges, the integration of the non-space, uh, um, uh, non-terrestrial, sorry, networks, um, uh, like uh, the space network with the terrestrial networks and overcome the current challenges that we have today. If you would uh, like to have this interconnection, you as a telecom provider, the Deutsche Telekom, for example, um, would need to call a satellite operator and say, okay, I need a link between these two satellites, this ground station and so on. I need it uh, Wednesday uh, at eight o'clock. And this is, a, this is something a telecom operator would never do because he needs the demand now he needs a system where he says, okay, I have uh, this bandwidth problem here and there, I need to have the capacity uh, interlinked, and then he should not care how this is working. So this kind of functionality we need in, in the space, in the terrestrial, uh, and the combination of the terrestrial network and the space networks as well, which is a complete different challenge from the optical. It's a network challenge that we need to cover, and we try to cover that also in, in the Hydron program, in the ESA program. So, so thank you. Yeah, that that that's a great great status. So the vision is to have really an, an interlink that, like like we have now, tapping into on on ground already, but including ground satellites and all available assets for for one network to to serve everyone. So that would be the vision. And the satellites even in different orbits. So we have mm -hmm. the LEO orbits for mega constellation. We will have uh, satellites in MEO orbit and in GEO orbit. So they all need to play uh, together. They will have their own space network. Uh, but we also need to extend that then to high uh, altitude platforms 
that provide a service uh, for for some areas of a football stadium, uh, for example. So we need to connect them, uh, and we are working also on uh, connections to aircraft in order to connect them also to the same uh, uh, network via space down to ground, uh, for example, is one of the applications. Okay, and have you an idea when this could be happening? So is it five years, ten years? Or a matter the, of money. <laughs> well, this uh, this is most likely a, a matter of of money. But the plans that we are currently having uh, here is is with Hydron um, the first implementation of. Uh, as I said, we want to go to the internet uh, in space in terabit uh, uh, with technologies that are scalable up to terabit, and we are planning to have a first implementation in the 25, 26 time frame for the first Leo component, and then we will, we are planning to extend that. Um, and we are currently in discussions uh, how we do that together with our member states that will be the driver. So maybe a little bit that was again more on optical communication. I think maybe we can we can ha have the same question a bit: how mature is it, and where do we want to go for the quantum? Com quantum part? Yeah, the uncertainty that we have in quantum due to Heisenberg is also to that question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> if I may make this little physical joke. Um, okay. the, the point is that uh, besides uh, a quantum key distribution, we are currently discussing with the, uh, with the experts, what are the applications for a quantum internet? When we just had, you mentioned the Skylight uh, mm -hmm. conference in Athens, we had there a workshop also uh, on quantum internet, and we will have other quantum uh, internet workshops. And by the way, we have also multiple of them around in Europe currently happening because everyone is keen to understand what is the application be be behind the quantum internet. In general, we can say this is the combination, the connection of quantum devices, uh, that is the connection of quantum computers, but the real application behind, we still have to identify this uh, uh, to the to the point. And what we at on the either side want to plan is together we see different stakeholders, and this is uh, down to the research companies. We really have to go down to the researchers also to understand the technology behind and the application to see what is feasible. Uh, together with them, uh, with uh, people coming from the uh, business area. Uh, and, and coming uh, with operators to the idea how a quantum internet system in space could look like. And uh, we are currently trying to shape that idea uh, for the upcoming ministerial conference uh, in ESA. Uh, but this will still require a lot of discussions to define really what is needed for a demonstration system uh, in orbit and what could be the application. This is uh, very flow, uh, very uh, free floating at that time. Mm -hmm. And I would be happy in the chat if we have some ideas uh, there uh, behind <laughs> that. Yeah, okay. But it's really ongoing, uh, yeah. Yeah. very down to the ground uh, 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 facts finding. Uh, Still needs to be defined, yes. Yes. Yes, thank you. So having all these great uh, things ongoing, ESA's role traditionally is enabling research and development. Um, is there any way how you can support the commercialization in this field? For you already mentioned the programs, how industry can participate, but yes, yeah. we in in the program where I'm coming from, the artist program in the telecommunication, we always had the. Uh, the uh, the driver behind uh, to support industry in developing their own businesses, be it on a complete system with operators and, and the big satellite primes, or be it down to to some box uh, that is providing uh, some data transmission through uh, through um, uh, the internet uh, in in space uh, to satellites, uh, having a power box uh, uh, serving the satellites. These kind of uh, products they are all. Um, able to use the artist programs in order to to develop their market evolution uh, or even new products. And as I said, this is the same also with Skylight. But we have also in ESA a new directorate, which is dealing with commercialization for all uh, areas in uh, in ESA, uh, from from launcher uh, until the space, so science 
uh, earth observation, all this is covered in that uh, program. So commercialization uh, and the development of uh, applications is, is another heart of ESA, not only looking for deep space missions uh, and going to the moon, but really also to support the industry in all areas and not only space industries, also industries that are out there, and we do that uh, since many years already, that are out there and saying, okay, with all this satellite data that we have there and the con uh, connectivity uh, that we can provide, potentially, but not only, with optical communication, all this together, I can imagine an application that nobody has developed so far. Also, these people, the non-space people at all, can come to ESA with their ideas and uh, and just use what is out there uh, as uh, satellite systems and uh, provided the data and create a complete new uh, new field of, of application. So we, we are trying to support industry uh, from the really research side uh, to the pure space um, uh, equipment development, system developments uh, up to the application side in, in all the fields that you can imagine. Yeah, that could, I think there is, uh... Things are changing a bit, and uh, it's good to hear it. Also, to know that there is a new, new this commercialization directorate dealing with that. Exactly. Um, so I, I think you mentioned it already, but the collaboration, um, collaborative efforts between ESA and other organizations, maybe European Commission or space agencies, um, in advancing that in general, but on our topic, of course. Um, how does it look like? Uh, is there particular roles or is it about the budget? Um, how does this collaboration work? Well, we have collaborations on many uh, areas and many levels. First of all, for the ones not familiar, uh, ESA is already an organization of the space agencies uh, of the different nations. So we have here uh, automatically uh, by nature, a collaboration with many of the space agencies in Europe, uh, with some more intensive, with, with others less, uh, depending perhaps also a bit on the size and the financial capabilities. And then, of, door, of, of course, uh, being Europe's space agency, uh, we have collaborations with NASA and the other space, uh, uh, agencies around the world in all fields. On optical comms, uh, we, we have uh, some uh, cooperation with NASA. Uh, as I said, there is a mission going to uh, the comet uh, um, psyche where we also cooperate here to provide optical ground stations to do the tests um, that is one cooperation then we have exchanges with the australian space agency that are very keen on optical comms uh, as well they have a couple of telescopes already deployed in australia in order to have an optical ground network um, and they are also looking in uh, developments of uh, quantum memory in space. And also here we see uh, ways of cooperating. And then, of course, with all the big other uh, agencies around the world, with JAXA, we have a quite uh, intensive uh, exchange in Japan. And uh, we had uh, just uh, um, a delegation visiting India also to see where cooperations are, are possible. And uh, so, we cover basically all around the world. There's no real limitation. Okay. I coming back a bit to the commercialization. So they need um, there, there is a need to bridge from the research, which is yeah coming from ESA, and then evaluate um, evolving into business. Mm -hmm. That not only for quantum physicists but security in general. Do you have a feeling or see a need that there still need more of awareness raising in public about this topic, about security um, and, and, and what's going on, so to, in, to get them involved? I think the current programs already try to, to uh, get certain awareness, but uh, the, the point is on, on which level and what topic uh, especially. I mean, security currently is already a very high awareness due to the situations that we see currently in Ukraine and Russia. So I think the topic is very much uh, to the point uh, already in many heads. And you have seen the recent success of the European Commission's initiative IRIS-2, uh, IRIS-Square, which uh, is uh, going to deploy together with industry uh, a security system uh, for the needs of uh, of Europe and I think all that uh, is is indeed uh, 
seen on the political level, but I think also uh, at the citizens level as a need that is absolutely mandatory and uh, perhaps needed even more before than before. Okay, thank you. So looking at the time and also that we don't have more questions, I would uh, like to wrap up, maybe coming back to the title question for, for a final statement. Will optical and quantum communications be the future of space? So I think it's pretty, yes, but I let you. <laughs> so I think uh, it, it will play, it, it plays already a large role in space for the different, uh, for the different applications. Uh, I think we will in space not be able to live without it anymore because we have the demand of the extremely high data rates for different applications, starting from Earth observation going higher, uh, to uh, communication and uh, to navigation and then going into the deep space apart and, and one of the applications and I hope we will see the first moon landing of a European uh, astronaut uh, uh, using optical comms in uh, in HD. So there is a big future of optical and quantum comms in space, but also space needs the technology in order to evolve further. So now I think we're through and have quite covered quite a lot. Thank you so much, Harald. It's been a real pleasure. <laughs> so I hope that it was you, informative. Yes. Yes, absolutely. For being for being with us and answering our burning questions. So it was very insightful. Thank okay. you. And uh, of course, we are available if somebody is interested to do anything in the Skylight program or in any other programs. Then uh, please contact me. Okay, and then for the audience, if you want to know more, a little Outlook teaser um, in the next Space Cafe Benelux, we will talk more about what also Harald mentioned already about the quantum communication and the European infrastructure. So stay tuned. And Elena, back to you. Or Torsten, whoever is. <laughs> yes, thank you, Heike. Um, I think my video is blocked, but uh, it's fine because, uh, okay, my connection should be stable now. So before we say goodbye, let me remind you of our upcoming events. On the 5th and 6th of July, Tourism will be in Brussels for the Space Forum, covering uh, from the conference for you. Uh, on the 6th of July, instead, at 3 p.m., we're going to have our Space Cafe Brazil by Ian Grosner with guests, uh, with um, hosting the ex-Portugal Minister for Higher Education, Professor Manuel Hayter, discussing how space innovation helps the people. On the 7th of July, instead at 4 p.m., exceptionally on a Friday, join, our, join us for a Space Cafe 33 Minutes with um, Dr. Joseph Axbahar, the Director General of, the, of ESA. So uh, tune in for that one. And on, on the 26th of July, at 4 p.m., we're having our Space Cafe Black Ops, hosting uh, Dr. Namrata Goswami for the fifth episode of the mini series dedicated to space politics and uh, to space policy and geopolitics uh, by our Dr. Uh, Emma Gatti, editor in chief of Space Watch Global. And on the 27th at 9:30 a.m., join us for a Space Cafe Law Breakfast with Professor Stephen Freeland, demystifying space law for you together with experts Axel Cartier and Dr. Ingo Baumann. And later that day at 4 p.m., join us for the second episode of Space Cafe Benelux um, by uh, Dr. Heike Pornian, as you have already heard from her. And on the fourth, and uh, as usual, all of our events are going to be online on Eventbrite, and we would love to hear your feedback. So please check in with us on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. And um, don't forget to sign up for our daily and bi-weekly newsletters. And if you'd like to treat yourselves to something special, become a space watcher today or help us in the supporter program. Thank you, Harald, for the, for the insightful talk and for You're being welcome. our guest. And thanks again to the entire team behind the scenes for doing this great job week by week again. Thank to you, our audience, for joining us. I hope to see you next week in upcoming events. In the meantime, visit our website and follow us on social media. Take care. And don't forget, become a space watcher. Goodbye. Thank you.